they can't live without this person and they don't know they we've lost ourselves in this relationship because this person has begun to control us so i also am starting workshops to show women there's plenty of ways to make your own money you may not think you have the best skill but you'll be surprised at what you pull out when i got out of my surviving situation I, I didn't think I could do anything but fast food. I knew I was smarter, but I just didn't know I was lost. And now I have my own party planning business. My children, who are all under the age of seven, have their own businesses. We've all decided to make a profit out of our talents and our gifts. So, and I wanna show other women, it's several ways out here to make money legally and you can still be safe as well you don't have to stay and jeopardize your life every day just for financials because mm -hmm. nothing in life is free so miss hawkins you think that uh, young women especially can be impacted uh, by some of the things that the two of you are doing yes i feel that if we can make strong young women we'll make stronger grown women mm -hmm. and that makes a stronger community a stronger household so i feel uh, Sparkle and I have spoken on several occasions and her children saw it, my children saw it, and they take on that mother role, that, that guidance role, that anytime someone comes around and they raise their voice, they feel a certain way. But we also wanted, we want to make sure that they don't end up victims because they saw us going through it and staying. So we feel that the more that we can pour into our young women and men that were, you know, willing to step forward, the more that they can pour into their families. And, we can and break so the young curse. ladies are really receptive to some of the information that the two of you are Surprisingly, uh -huh. I, I was shocked mm -hmm. to hear the response back, mm -hmm. like high school and um, middle schoolers, the, the communication, you know, they're telling the stories that went on in their families or people that they witnessed it through and how they bond together to try to make a difference between each other. In other words, when they understand some of the things that the two of you are talking about, they can uh, regulate their own uh, relationships with uh, the young men or with everybody else uh, concerning domestic violence. And so you think that the way that the two of you are trying to uh, approach dealing with domestic violence is good and should be used more widely. More individuals yeah. ought to be involved with what uh, the two of you are talking about. Yes. And so what we'll do, we'll take our final commercial break and then we'll get back and we'll have about 10 minutes to talk about some of the solutions that we might have in reference to domestic violence. And we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break.
Thank you and welcome back to the final segment of the show for today. We're talking to Ms. Johnson and Ms. Hawkins in reference to domestic violence in Nashville. And of course, ladies, I think you've given us some excellent information in reference to this as an issue. And let's give you an opportunity during the last 10 minutes to uh, bring into view some of the things that you wanted to talk about on your way over and to make sure that you have an opportunity so that when you get out of here, you won't say, I forgot to say it. So this is that uh, opportunity. I think he was riding in a car to, with us. Mm -hmm. You know, he's in our <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because I know, you know, I know uh, the pressure that it can come and then when you move away from it, you remember other things. And so we want to give you an opportunity during the last 10 minutes, Ms. Uh, Watkins and uh, Ms. Johnson, uh, to uh, talk about uh, some of the things that we're, we're dealing with here. Okay, uh, we also wanted to make sure that everyone knows domestic violence isn't just relationship, husband and wife, girlfriend and boyfriend. It's also family, it's anyone that's intimate close to you. So mm -hmm. a lot of times we may be projecting it to our children and not realizing it. Say mm -hmm. we have an issue with the dad. I can't stand you. Get out of my face. You look just like him. You're gonna be nothing just like him. Or the dad have a uh, issue with the mama. Like you just fast just like your mama. I just can't stand you. Look at you. Mm -hmm. You know we're building monsters. Mm -hmm. So we need to pay attention to how we talk to our children. Mm -hmm. uh, not only what they see us do, they're like sponges. They start at an early age and they soak up everything that we do and we don't realize it even if we think we're sending them away to another room you know they hear and they see so I feel that we also need to make sure that be known that domestic violence isn't just a husband a wife girlfriend or boyfriend thing it uh, goes over into family so we need to pay attention to how we're talking to our children and our brothers and sisters mm -hmm. as well so what do you think the uh, city of Nashville is doing in reference to trying to regulate this as an issue? Oh, well, I think, and that's so funny that you asked that because that's something that me and Ms. Hawkins <laughs> both have different opinions on. Well, you, let's share the two and of you. So, yeah, that's why I said that's good because <laughs> I actually think it's a lot being done but it's not being shown. Like, it, it starts somewhere, and it has been quiet and a silent killer for a long time. Mm -hmm. But now it's a lot of people and organizations that are starting to rise up and w raise mm -hmm. awareness. Now, the fear is, though, that we work closely with the police department and let them know, because some people are not coming to people with badges. They're intimidated by badges. Mm -hmm. But they'll come to me because I look like them. They'll come to Ms. Hawkins because she mm -hmm. looks like them. And so when we have other organizations that rise up in the name of domestic violence, it's important to keep it domestic violence mm -hmm. because when you change it to things like bullying or drug awareness, mm -hmm. it takes the attention off of domestic mm -hmm. violence. If that's how we're going to start it, that's how we need to keep the awareness because mm -hmm. that's the silent killer. Mm -hmm. No, go on. Uh, I'm not saying that bullying and drug awareness mm -hmm. isn't important. But if you stand in the name of domestic violence, keep that stand with those that are around you, those that are watching you, because just like children are sponges, adults are too. Mm -hmm. And they're watching. And there's is somebody out there right now saying, them two look good. Mm -hmm. If they can come out and if they can survive, and not only survive, but speak about it publicly, I can do it too. I can get out of it too. Mm -hmm. So we, if we're going to stand for that, we need to stay for that and don't change it for lights, cameras, and actions. If you're gonna be for domestic violence, say that and be that and work with the police for that. Do not let anybody else change that because once you change your stance, they're gonna feel shy about it. Why did she change? Why did they hide it? Why did they cover it up now? Mm -hmm. And it, the cycle repeats. Ms. Hawkins, let's see if we can uh, have you to uh, think in terms of some of the things that people desperately need to know about domestic violence and over the last four or five minutes to talk about some of those things. That is real, <laughs> the number one thing, that it is just real and it's out here. And we need to recognize the signs. You need to recognize how a person talk to you. You know, it's one thing to laugh and joke. And personally, myself now, because of what I've gone through, I don't want to be around 
if every time we're around each other, someone has to call me a name. Mm -hmm. You know, someone has to put me down. Whether they're saying it that is jokingly, you know, that's a taught behavior. Yeah. So that's how it starts off in a relationship. It starts off as a joke, and then it gets more and more. And just like our children are sponges soaking it up, we're soaking this up. So we need to pay attention. If you're starting a fresh new relationship, and it start off with you talking about each other, joking about each other, uh, and it keeps going, keeps going, there's never nothing sweet. There's you funny looking, or you this. No one would ever want to be with you, and they laugh behind it. They're just building up a bigger monster. Mm -hmm. And then it will take it to the next stage, where then it's a hit here and there. Oh, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. Then it hit again. Oh, I'm sorry, look what you, what, what you made me do. Mm -hmm. You know, like I took your hands or took that bottle or took whatever and hit through it at myself. And be aware with that, because after that, it's going to come, there's no more apologies. Mm -hmm. It's just going to be flat out in front, just a smack for no reason, mm -hmm. you know. And they always find a way to direct it to you that it's your fault. Everything that goes wrong in your life, in their life, is directly related to you. You done this to me. You know, you making me act this way. So we need to be aware of our triggers. We need to be aware of the warning signs to let you know, hey, it's too much going on here. I'm not feeling good. So if you're in a relationship where you feel like you're in, in, inadequate, and you have no self-worth about it, you need to evaluate that relationship and seek help. I would never tell someone to leave because they will have to want to leave on them, their own. And then I wouldn't want them to leave and then something happened, they said, I, I, I told, told them, you. so they <laughs> yeah. did. So you need to look, what's it, Michael Jackson said, starting with the man in the mirror? Yes, you sir. need to look in the mirror yourself and you need to ask yourself, is this the life that God has laid out for me? If, if this, is this the man or the woman I want to spend the rest of my life with? Because with so much that's going on in the world, mm -hmm. we should be working on building relationships, not just flames. Do you think, uh, <clears throat> Ms. Johnson, that uh, there are folks out there this morning who can use this information and because of some of the things that the two of you are saying, it will have an impact upon them? Absolutely, and me and Ms. Hawkins had this talk one early morning that sometimes it, it gets frustrating because we're trying to reach out. We don't want people to go through what we went through or worse. We don't want someone to bury their ch or the children to bury their parents. And so we reach out and we reach out and sometimes we just feel ignored or like they don't care. But if one person hears and takes a stand for their own life and the life of their children and their loved ones, that's a multitude mm -hmm. to us. Mm -hmm. And we've got about a minute. Take this final minute, uh, Ms. Hawkins, and say something in reference to this. Again, I'm uh, Tiffany Hawkins with V2V. I can be reached at 615-928-0793. If you have any issues, you have any questions, if I don't have the resources, or Sparkle with Superwomen Inc. do not have the resources, together we can combine and find help. And to bring your children out, March the 23rd, 2019 at 11 at the Northwest YMCA for Danger Dating. We must get awareness to our young girls about the situation that's going on. And we also would like to extend our hands to our government because we are grassroots. And everything that we do, we do out of pocket. So we really can use, you know, the help of our community, our government to help us. Mm -hmm. And you find that uh, there's some sentiment in reference to the, what the two of you are doing uh, in the community and all over that people are come, becoming much more aware yes. of some of the issues dealing with domestic violence. And that's what the two of you are trying to do is simply to push that awareness. You don't expect to end it, no. but at least you do expect that when, once people become aware of it, they can be more conscious of some of the things that are coming at them, okay? And a lot of times when we hear violence, they never really say domestic violence. They mm -hmm. just say stop the violence. Okay, very good. And let me thank the two of you, and let me encourage our audience to tune in again next week for another informative edition of Comments. Thank you, and good morning.
Thank you and welcome to the show this morning. The topic this morning is overcoming domestic violence. And we're fortunate to have with us to talk about ways to overcome domestic violence, a Pastor Kay Walker, Ms. Watkins, and uh, Ms. Johnson. And let me welcome the three of you, Pastor Walker, uh, Ms. Watkins, and uh, Ms. Hawkins, and Ms. Johnson. Let me welcome the three of you to the show this morning and tell you how delighted we are to have you here. And the uh, topic that we're talking about this morning is overcoming domestic violence. But before we get into that, let's give uh, the three of you this opportunity to make some statements in reference to your background, your education, and some of your experiences. And by that time, we should be able to move into the second segment, and then we'll have an opportunity to talk about ways to overcome domestic violence. Let's start off with you, Pastor, and then have uh, Ms. Johnson and uh, Ms. Hawkins to give some information in reference to their background, education, and some of their experiences. Uh, well, first of all, thank Dr. Haney again, been doing this with you for quite some time now, but every time it's a new experience, you know, I'm Pastor Kelvin L. Walker. I'm an associate pastor with uh, Fairfield Missionary Baptist Church under the senior pastor, Howard Jones, Jr. I'm born and raised right here in Nashville, Tennessee, attended the public school systems uh, here in Nashville. Uh, had my own mindset. I was raised by good parents, but I had my own mindset. You know, I decided, you know, I was going to do life my way. And of course, when you start doing life your way as a, as a teen and stuff like that, as a young boy, you know, you end up going astray. And I went astray, uh, ended up uh, on drugs, um, getting in trouble, uh, ended up shooting somebody. And Judge Jenkins sent me into the military as opposed to sending me into the juvenile courts, into the juvenile lockup system, feeling that that would be much better for me. I would actually idea was, the thought was I would spend more time in there than I would in lockup. Uh, of course, that didn't work out either because my behavior, you know, just escalated, you know, the more I was exposed to other ideas and other thoughts and other cultures and different things like that. But I uh, got out of the military, uh, attended OIC, got a GED, did some studies at Tennessee State University, wanted to become a fashion designer. But my heroin addiction got the best of me, and uh, of course, that's my life started spiraling downward, ended up incarcerated in the state prison system for a number of years and uh, got released and back into my old behaviors in, on August 24th, 1986, God divinely intervened in my life, stopped a 17 plus year drug addiction and a lifestyle of crime and crazy behavior and called me into ministry. That's what I've been doing ever since. Mm -hmm. Ms. Hawkins, what about your background, education, some of the in information? All right, my name is Tiffany Hawkins. I have a domestic violence nonprofit called V2V, From Victims to Victory. I was prompted to start it um, after coming out of domestic relationship for years. And the struggle going through it is it, really both, it's needed education for both the man and the woman coming through because dealing with someone coming out of domestic violence is kind of like what we said earlier, it's like going to war. We kind of get shell-shocked. So, um, and my husband has a program called Dads Against Destruction mm -hmm. where he's working with restoring the men. So it's, it's a family thing that needs to be done when making that change. Mm -hmm. Ms. Johnson. My name is Sparkle. I'm 34 years old. I am also a survivor of domestic violence. I've been a survivor for three years. I was in a six year domestic violence relationship. I now have my own nonprofit. I'm a graduate from Hillsborough House High School and I'm scheduled to start TSU in August as an undergrad. And just like Pastor said, uh, I got in a lot of trouble and things of that nature. And I'm actually writing a book called Prison to Prison. Mm -hmm where I'm telling my story about being in prison for being a suspect once, and then also being a victim and being mentally and abusively in prison. Mm -hmm. and, and so in a real sense, the three of you have a lot of information to give our audience concerning efforts to overcome uh, domestic violence and some of the things that not only have impacted your lives, but uh, more than likely uh, impacted uh, others as well, which is to say that when we get into these kinds of situations, not only it, does it have an impact upon us, but it also have an impact upon those around us. As a matter of fact, I think that that is one thing that has come through quite clear talking to the three of you is that uh, 
that uh, there are others outside of ourselves who are impacted by some of the things that we do. And, and so I'm delighted to have an opportunity to bring the three of you together so that we can talk about uh, some of the issues of overcoming domestic violence. And so what we'll do is to take our first commercial break and then we'll come back and we'll try to uh, leave the audience with some information as to how people might be able to overcome domestic violence. And we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break. Thank you and welcome back to the second segment of the show for today. We're talking to Pastor Walker, uh, Ms. Hawkins, and uh, Ms. Johnson in reference to overcoming domestic violence. And so Ms. Johnson, as we promised uh, the last time, we'd give you an opportunity to start us off talking about methods whereby people might be able to overcome domestic violence. And of course, uh, Ms. Uh, Watkins, uh, Ms. Hawkins will <laughs> follow that, and Pastor Walker, will give us some information in reference to that during this second segment. Let's start with you, Ms. Johnson. And then Ms. Hawkins. <laughs> Let's start, Ms. Johnson. Well, first, the most important thing is notice the red signs, but also act on those red signs, mm. or red flags, I'm sorry. When I had red, I, when I tell you all, I had the best red flags and ignored every last one of them. One of the best ones, he told me he hit women. I was playfully hit him in his shoulder and he said, hey, hey, with a serious face, he said, hey, I hit women. And I was like, whatever. I didn't think anyone was that bold to say that. And then I met his mom and his mom said, I'm gonna pray for you for getting involved with my son. And the third best red flag I had was he was going to court on a pending domestic violence charge. And I ignored, and this was in the first month that I met him, I found all this out and went nowhere. And then six years later, that very man and three children later, my life was almost taken. So notice those red flags, act on those red flags immediately. What do you think about that, Ms. Hawkins? I totally agree. A lot of times we want everything that, to glean to be gold, and it's not. You know, we want what we think we want. And we also need to look at our children, look at the ones that's being involved in it, because we take down a whole family with dealing with someone who really don't care anything for us, have no respect at all for us. And I suggest counseling, not only for the surviving, because I say that we're always surviving, so we're not a survivor because we hadn't completed it. Uh, get counseling for the surviving as well as the children. Mm -hmm. A lot of times the children are overlooked in that process mm -hmm. because they w may not have been the one physically, but that mental picture that we paint in their head mm -hmm. for them listening to night after night, you know, watching mom get up and clean up a broken up house and mm -hmm. uh, trying to hide bruises thinking that's normal. Mm -hmm. We want our children to know that violence is not the new normal. We need to take on the whole aspect of anyone that was connected as a support team to get the help. That's the main thing into working with them. And whomever we get involved with, they have to know up front, this is what happened. 
and you have to set your boundaries. Because of this to happen, I cannot allow this, this, or this mm -hmm. at no time. And once we set those boundaries, stand on those boundaries. It doesn't do any good to have them set, like Sparkle said, see the signs and know they're there, and you still work on mm -hmm. it as if you're God. Mm -hmm. So we can't ask him to help us if we're not going to mm -hmm. take the help that he gives us. Pastor. You know, Dr. Henry, I think a lot of times, a lot of men, I think their manhood is founded on purely physical, you know, and in terms of thinking that, you know, in order for me to be in, in control, for me to be in charge, you know, then I have to be physical. You know, I have to uh, put her in her place, you know, and, and then you guys, I think a lot of insecurities as well that goes along with that too, uh, man being insecure. In, in terms of in a woman here, a man wants a strong woman, but then when she uh, displays her strength, mm -hmm. then he becomes uh, challenged or, or fearful or that insecurity kind of rises to the surface, you know, and, and he's got this thing that goes on in his mind, you know, well, I'm going to put you in your place. Mm -hmm. And the only way that he know how to do it mm -hmm. is through violence, you know, which makes no sense at all. And, you know, then you got men that think, you got the thought process out there that, uh, well, she, I treat her right. She, she want me to hit her, you know. Mm -hmm. She ain't satisfied unless I put my hands on her and stuff like that. And of course, you know, we all know that don't make sense at all whatsoever. But that's a thought process that's out there that men walk around with, you know. And, and another thing is, you know, I, I tell men all the time, I said, man, one of the best things you can learn how to do is cry, <laughs> you know, because you learn how to cry, man. You can you can get yourself you you can stay out of jail. Mm -hmm. You you can uh, avoid being an abuser mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because a lot of times what it is, man, you know, you you receive pain mm -hmm. and hurt, emotional pain and hurt, and instead of dealing with that pain, then what you want to do is share sure. it, mm -hmm. you know. And then when you're trying when you're sharing it, you you and it's not like you're sitting down having a conversation saying, "Well, you know, when you said this, you my feelings were hurt or something like that." No, it's not that. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm gonna share my pain with you in a physical way because my manhood is founded on purely physical things, mm -hmm. you know. And that's how I control. You know, if I'm dealing with an, another individual, another man, you know, you step to me, you know, what I'm saying it's gonna we're gonna get physical, mm -hmm. you know. And then same thing, you know, that that mindset, you know, goes into our relationships, you know, with, with women as well. So, and, and that's, that's a lot out there, man, that, you know, that men deal with. And when you're afraid to deal with yourself and to confront your own self and deal with your own issues, then what you'll do, man, you'll lash out at the person that's closest to you and then you'll end up hurting them and then now you want to run and say, well, I'm sorry, this, I won't do it again, you know, this will never happen again. But at the same time, how can you say that when you've never, when you haven't dealt with the core issue that caused you to do it in the first place? So in other words, you're just mouthing some stuff off. And then, you know, like you said, you know, you hang around, you hang around, and the red flags are there, but like you say, you ignore the red flags, but this guy's flying red flags everywhere. <laughs> the woman's ignoring him, he's ignoring him. He, He's not just ignoring. He's just he's just not dealing with it. You know, I'm just not gonna deal with it. You know, I'm a man. You know, I I can handle mine. And in all reality, you're not handling. And you're anything. the cause of all of mine anyway. Oh yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. A lot of times they don't even think that they they are the issue. They don't even right. see that what they're doing is wrong. They find a way to put it on that uh, survivor. They find a way to make it that person's fault, and it's not my fault. So no matter how many red flags, he, you see red, he see green. Mm -hmm. So he's going to keep going because, like he said, he's proven his manhood. Mm -hmm. I'm flexing to you. Mm -hmm. Very good. And so what we'll do, we'll take our second commercial break, and then when we come back, we'll have 10 minutes to uh, sort of round this off. And I think the uh, information that you're giving now is excellent. Uh, it's information that is much needed, and I think it does point a way how people might be able to overcome some of the challenges of domestic violence. And of course, we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break.
Thank you and welcome back to the final segment of the show for today. We're talking to Pastor Walker, uh, Ms. Hawkins, and uh, Ms. Johnson in reference to efforts to overcome domestic violence. And I think, uh, Ms. Haw uh, Hawkins, we promise you that uh, we'd give you an opportunity to start us off during this last segment. And after you make some statements, uh, Ms. Johnson will uh, talk about some of the things in reference to uh, domestic violence and overcoming domestic violence, and Pastor Walker will close us off for the day. Let's start off, uh, Ms. Hawkins. All right, uh, again, my name is Tiffany Hawkins. I, coming through domestic violence, I think that one of the most important thing is when you start in a relationship for you and your spouse or you and your potential spouse. Significant other. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. get a chance to know each other. You mm -hmm. cannot come from out of the jungle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Being in a domestic relationship is, is war. So you cannot come from out of a jungle mm -hmm. and go directly into civilization mm -hmm. and expecting everything to be good. Mm -hmm. And for the person that's speaking with the person that you're talking with, they need to know you. You know, it's a hard thing out here to trust, to build trust again once you've been hurt, mentally and physically. And it's a hard thing for someone if they have never dealt with a domestic situation to understand and offer assistance to that lady or that man. I feel that, like I said, they're getting counseling. The, the uh, survivor should be getting counseling along with her children. But at some point, that potential needs to get it as well, to know how to deal with that person. They need to learn the ways. They need to learn how important it is not to cross those boundaries, the, the monster that they create, because it puts that person immediately on defense. And once they've been on that fence for so long, it's no coming off of it. No matter how much love there, no matter how much good intentions are there, the, the hurt is just there and the fear. And it's not that you're running from something, you're running to something. You're mm -hmm. running to that safe place. Mm -hmm. And that's to be away from somewhere where I feel like I'm intimidated. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, like I spoke earlier, my husband has a program called uh, Dads Against Destruction, Restoring Fatherhood, which help, uh, also helps young men that's coming out of incarceration or just had a bad bout in life, help them find their ways, help them be the men in their household. So you, you would need a program or something like that that can help you cope with this person if you feel that you want to deal with it. It's not going to be something that's going to happen overnight, and your alpha male ego can't take precedence over those feelings because every time it's just going to cause turmoil mm. and um, an outrage and cause more confusion than need to be. Mm -hmm. So I really think that everyone should get to know that person before moving to the mm -hmm. next relationship and actually calling it a relationship. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mr. Johnson? Uh, I agree 110% mm -hmm. because unlike Ms. Hawkins, I'm single and I tried after a year of being out of that situation. I thought I was ready and I have had failed dating experiences back to back to back. And now justifiably they were wrong in some instances, but most of it boiled down to me not being ready. Um, PTSD for mm. domestic violence victims mm. is real. Um, sometimes it could be just a smell. Uh, I dated one guy that wore the same cologne mm -hmm. and I completely flipped out. Mm -hmm. I wasn't ready. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we talk a lot and one minute she'll hear me say I'm dating this guy and the next minute she's like, so how are you and so, so, oh, he gone. <laughs> He's gone. And, and a part of it is good because I know my worth now, but however, I'm still healing. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to be what anybody else needs me to be right now. So we have to slow down. We have to get to know people. We have to feel safe again, but they have to understand that. So I think it was really great that Ms. Hawkins said that counseling needs to take place because it's a struggle. Of course, nobody wants to be alone. And of course, it's a sense of power. I want to get just a little deep, if that's okay. Good. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's a sense of power there because every time one of these relationships fail and I realize that it's my fault, mm. a part of me get upset. I'm sorry, y'all. 
<laughs> I get upset with myself because I feel like he's incarcerated, he's serving 20 years, but he has control over my life mm -hmm. to where I can't have a healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. And he's been gone for three years. Mm -hmm. So it's a sense of frustration there, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, mm -hmm. that's it. No, very good, mm -hmm. Pastor. You know, I, you know, I, you know, people stand on the outside and look in, man, and, and think they know what's going on mm -hmm. and don't even realize, you know, just the, the impact, you know, mm -hmm. that, you know, someone could, how it can affect someone that's been involved in a, in a domestic violence situation, you know. <clears throat> you know, I, uh, my daughter was murdered in a domestic violence situation back in, in uh, 2015, you know, the day before my birthday. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you, you sit back and you look and you don't see nothing wrong. You know what I'm saying? You don't, you don't see anything out of whack, you know. And then all of a sudden something like this, you know, something like that happens, you know. And people don't realize, I don't think people understand just what a, a woman would go through. And, you know, you talk about, you know, a woman getting to know the man before you just get deeper into the relationship. But at the same time, you have to make sure the man knows who he is. Because mm -hmm. if he has no clue as yes. to who he is, man, I lived many years of my life without really even knowing who I was, man. You know what I'm saying? So I just, I always went to the, went with the flow, man. You know what I'm saying? Because I really didn't know who I was. I didn't really, I wasn't really in touch with my own uh, feelings, feelings, my mm -hmm. own desires. I mean, I lived many years, you know, and really just didn't really, I had feelings, but I didn't display those feelings. You know what I'm saying? And when they did come out, they always came out in a negative way. You know, and it, it wasn't until I started looking deep on the inside of me and get to, getting to know myself that I was able to share the real me, you know, with someone. And, and, you know, you don't know it. If you don't know, you don't know. But when you got a, in a relationship with somebody and you say, well, you know what? Uh, you don't know everything. I don't know everything. But we can get some counseling that together we can learn and grow together. Yeah. And then the person starts shying away from that. That's a man. I believe right there. That's a red flag right yeah. there. Because what they're saying is, what they're saying. I think, and a man does it. I would. I think that's what it's saying to the woman is that. Look, I already know who I am. You know, mm -hmm. I don't need that. You go get you some counseling and stuff. But in reality, I'm insecure mm -hmm. to the degree that I don't want to get get open up. And allow uh, you to get that close to me, mm -hmm, you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? But at the same time, I want to be in a relationship with mm -hmm. you, but I don't want you to get that close. But I don't want to open up and let you get close to me. So, I mean, what is that really saying? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, but one thing is saying, I'm not, I'm not committed to anything. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to be with me on my terms. If you can't be with me on my terms, then, that, you know, we just won't. It's just not going to happen. And so in a real sense, it always pays to talk about it. Uh, what's going on in the real sense. You have to. Mm -hmm. Communication. And that's why each of you keep talking about counseling, counseling, and counseling. But you don't have to go to an official counselor. There ought to be somebody within all of our lives that we can talk to about these kinds of situations. Would that be? A lot of times, especially dealing with domestic, <laughs> that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Because what you don't want to do is pour your heart out to someone mm -hmm. and you're hurting and you hear it again. You th it's thrown back up in your face, whether they've told someone or they blurted out in the heat of an argument, mm -hmm. and that knocks you down mm -hmm. one more level because here you have opened up to this person and, and poured yourself out and they done that. So, but if I go to a professional, I can sue you. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If sense. you tell mm -hmm. my story, you know, mm -hmm. then, so they have a reason not to talk. Mm -hmm. This is just me personally. Very good. And of course, let me uh, thank the uh, three of you for bringing by that excellent information uh, in reference to overcoming domestic violence as well as domestic violence. And the only thing that we can say is that uh, we hope that uh, uh, individuals who might see this might have another insight into how some of the things that the three of you have talked about this morning uh, might help them overcome some of the challenges that they face in their, uh, their own lives. And so mm -hmm. you never can tell. But I think that uh, as long as the word is out, and I think the three of you have uh, put the word out this morning, let me thank you. And let me encourage our audience to tune in again next week for another informative edition of Comments. Thank you and good morning.
at Vanderbilt University and mm -hmm. at Tennessee State mm -hmm. University for all those years. Mm -hmm. And how, how long have you been doing the show? Since 1976. My goodness, wow. Uh, how many years is that? I don't even... Thank you and welcome to the show this morning. The topic this morning is African Americans and uh, biblical interpretations. And we have with us to talk about African Americans and biblical interpretations, uh, Mr. Marbury, Professor Marbury from Vanderbilt University, who will tell us some information in reference to his background, education, and some of his experiences, after which we will get into the topic African, African Americans and Biblical Interpretations. Let's start off, uh, uh, Dr. Marlberg, by giving us some information about your background, education, and some of your experiences. Well, I was born right here in Nashville. I'm, I'm a native Nashvillian, I guess. Um, matter of fact, born uh, right up the street there, off of uh, on Clarksville and Ed Temple. And, um, but my father was a military um, chaplain, and so we moved around quite a bit. My, um, I come from a family of, uh, of ministers, my, uh, both my grandfathers, great-grandfather and uncles, Methodist ministers. And so uh, we moved around quite a bit, spent a lot of time in Atlanta. And um, I fell in love with the work of the church early on, uh, partly because I spent so much time there as, as, a, as, a, as a child. But um, later on, we, uh, we, we settled in Atlanta, and I did much of my education there. Um, started out at uh, Emory University, undergraduate, and um, majored in African American Studies and English Lit, and then moved on to Gammon Theological Seminary at ITC, uh, where I uh, earned an MDiv in Biblical, Biblical Studies, and um, finally I um, uh, moved back to Nashville and uh, earned a PhD in, um, in Religion at Vanderbilt University. So uh, that brings me here. Along the way, I've been a United Methodist minister, uh, served as, served as, a, as pastor of uh, Old National United Methodist Church, and uh, one of my greatest joys was serving as the uh, university chaplain at Clark Atlanta University for several years. And so once I left Clark Atlanta University, I returned here again to Nashville and um, I took a faculty position at Vanderbilt, mm -hmm. and so. And so in a real sense, you've been involved with the church one way or the, uh, or the other, all, not only all of your life, but uh, it seems that many uh, members of your family yes. were also involved with the church for all of, and, and, and I would imagine for a long time, it has been the Methodist church. It, would, would that be it, a, a fair assumption in reference to that? It has been, it has been. Growing up, my, uh, I remember sitting, um, sitting you know, in the pew, listening to my grandfather preach, and. Uh, he, he knew each member by their names, their faces, and their stories. And every Sunday, he'd find a way to integrate their, their stories and their, their hearts and minds with a word from the Lord and uplift the people who had often been downtrodden by, by the world. Mm -hmm. And so that was, my, that was the, the beginning of my introduction to African-American biblical interpretation. Mm -hmm. uh, it was sitting by my grandfather and watching him deal with what was going on around him, what was the ways that the community was being assaulted in the 50s and 60s, mm -hmm. and, uh, and um, hearing those stories about how he dealt with, um, how, he, how he dealt with not only the church, but how he empowered the church to deal with the world. Um, and later on, as I, as I would sit with him in, the, in these late 70s and early 80s, uh, I learned the power of what it meant to be, be that kind of a pastor. Mm -hmm. Very good. And so let's uh, look at some of the areas dealing with uh, African Americans and biblical interpretation. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that uh, 
there are many, so many parallels in terms of the African story and uh, the Bible mm -hmm. that uh, we've heard many of them time and time again, but from a professional and uh, from a scholastic point of view, talk about it from that uh, point yeah. of view. Well, I think African Americans, interestingly enough, uh, from the beginning of our journey here in, in, the, uh, in the Americas, uh, have gravitated toward the Exodus story. Mm -hmm. And that's because there's so many easy parallels mm -hmm. between uh, the, uh, the Exodus story and the African American experience mm -hmm. in bondage. Uh, the, the themes of bondage and slavery easily transfer mm -hmm. to the African American experience in the United States. Mm -hmm. And figures like Harriet Tugman and uh, Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass and so many others mm -hmm. uh, are often signified with, uh, with the identity of Moses. Uh, and, and African Americans have found themselves reading the Bible in what we call a figurative way. That is to take the Bible and look at it not only historically, but to, but to understand that these, these historical themes find their way into, into the present and tell us about the future. So, these, so we read our own story through these, through these themes. And so uh, figuratively, uh, we, we live into the text. Very good. So what we'll do, we'll take our first commercial break mm -hmm. and then we'll come back and we'll have uh, eight minutes and we'll allow you to uh, continue this discussion. And we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break. You don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate you. Oh. Very good. No, I'm, I'm happy to do it. I, I, next time you got to call me early, though. You got to hey, let me. Well, get, it you never happens. Call that me way. the night before. <laughs> it never happens that way. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Baldwin introduced you to us, and yes. you know, you got to be ready. You know, I mean, he's a he's a dear friend of mine. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I've, I've known him. Uh, well, since. I was over at Vanderbilt from 71 to 76, and mm -hmm. that's, I met most yeah. of the folks over there then, mm -hmm. you see, and uh, a lot of folks. You, you never, you didn't know what uh, Reverend Kelly Miller Smith, I, I think. I did not know that, him, no. Yeah, yeah, that was after, yeah, yeah. And, yeah he was a great, mm -hmm. great Are you ready? Great, yes, ma'am. <laughs> African American. Thank you and welcome back to the second segment of the show for today. <clears throat> we're, 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 we're talking about African Americans and uh, the uh, Bible, and uh, we've been given some excellent information uh, by uh, Dr. Marbury in reference to some of the things that uh, Africans have been involved in dealing with uh, the Bible. And so, uh, Professor, let's see if we can pick up where we left off and to... Uh, give you an opportunity over the uh, next eight minutes to sort of bring things together mm -hmm. in reference to the African experience and mm -hmm. the biblical mm -hmm. experience. Well, as I was saying, African Americans took up the Bible at, in figural readings. And so we would, we would take the Bible and read it, not only historically, mm -hmm. but we would read our own story into the text. And we understood that if the, t if the narrative ended this way, in a particular way for the Hebrews, mm -hmm. Uh, then we believed it would end this way for us. So if, if, if God rescued the Hebrews from bondage, then we believe that God would rescue us from bondage. If God, if God abhorred the slavery in Egypt, then God abhors slavery in the United States and oppression in the United States. And those, those types of readings empowered us. Now, we didn't, be, we, we didn't originate those types of readings. Uh, you, you have to know that the Puritans themselves understood themselves as living through the Exodus story. They saw tyranny in Europe, tyranny in Britain, as, uh, and read that as, as ancient Egypt, and saw their journey to the New World as a journey across the Jordan to Canaan. Uh, now, we, as African Americans, when we pick up the story, we generally pick up the first 14 chapters, that is the slavery in Egypt mm -hmm. and, and freedom mm -hmm. oh, uh, at the Red Sea. How we got over. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, the Puritans, however, picked up the next part of the text, that is, they became God's military arm, 
cleaning out Canaan. And, and, so, and they lived that out in relation to the Native Americans. And so we, we see very different readings uh, and, ve and gravitation toward very different parts mm -hmm. of the Exodus story uh, with uh, the Puritans and then uh, and, and later generations of successive generations of, of, uh, of Americans and African Americans in the ways that we took up the text um, primarily for freedom and then then toward uplift. So two very different ways of taking up the text. Um, what was interesting to me, what has always been interesting to me growing up, is how the Bible can mean one thing to one congregation and or one group of people or one region of the nation. And the same biblical text can, be, can mean something entirely different to another congregation, to a congregation next door, down the street, or in another region. And so in the United States, we have not only red states and blue states, but we have red congregations and blue congregations reading from the same text, believing two enti entirely different, entirely differently about, about who God is and God's activity in the world and how we should respond to God's activity in the world. Um, so I am, in my book, I look at ways that, my recent book, Pillars of Cloud and Fire, I look at ways uh, that African Americans have taken up the text beginning mm. in, the, uh, in the antebellum period, just before, just before, um, just before the Civil War. Mm. And so I look at, um, for example, in the antebellum period, African Americans read the text and understood that the promised land was, was emancipation. Mm -hmm. and, um, and once emancipation came in, in 1865, uh, we began to reconfigure our understanding of Exodus. We held on to the same story, but the promised land then became uplift. You know, how, are we, how do we find our, a way to, to gain some you know, economic status, educational status? How do, we raise, how do we raise our quality of life in a world that still hates us? Um, and so from 1865 to up until the Harlem Renaissance, during that, that is during the era of reconstruction, um, you find African Americans reading the Exodus story still, but no longer talking about emancipation, but the promised land became uplift. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Harlem Renaissance, uh, you find figures like um, Zora Neale Hurston in her book, Moses, Man of the Mountain, mm -hmm. uh, and others, taking up the Exodus story again, but this time no longer talking about uplift, but talking about what it means to be the Harlem, the, the Harlem Renaissance's new Negro. That's be the creative new, yes, in a real sense. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, creative, but what does it mean to, mm -hmm. to, to become a new person absent the manacles of slavery? How do we, how do we, how do we pull off the, the vestiges of slavery? And that was a at a time when, when um, you know, in, in American popular culture, you saw, you saw Sambos, you saw Piccaninnies, you saw all mm -hmm. of those, the you know, Jemimas, all black of those, faces yeah, and, all blackface, all those stereotypical mm -hmm. figures used to advertise products. They were all a part of the cultural landscape. And the Harlem Renaissance uh, writers wanted to, wanted to produce a more authentic representation, as they saw it, of African American cultural life. And, um, and so for them, who is this, who is this new Negro, this, this, this yeah. new African American person who is, who is, not seen through the stereotypes of, um, of the white gaze, but seen in a way that is, that is authentically herself or himself. And Zora Neale Hurston works hard. Langston Hughes does the same thing, but Zora Neale Hurston focuses on the Exodus story in a powerful way. She, she reconfigures in, a, in, a, in, I think, a novel length sermon, really, uh, reconfigures the Exodus story in a way that speaks to empowerment for African Americans and offers a critique of leadership and empowers the people. Uh, so if you haven't read Moses, Man of the Mountain, mm -hmm. uh, uh -huh. powerful, powerful. And so once the Harlem Renaissance sort of dies down after the, uh, after the Great Depression, of course, uh, and then we get into uh, World War II, uh, we, we begin the Civil Rights Movement. And here now, um, African Americans begin to rethink Again, what, what is this promised land and what is slavery? Slavery is not being enslaved. It's not, it's not what it meant to live life in Reconstruction. But now slavery is living under Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. And the promised land is what does it mean to have the Voting Rights Act, the Public Accommodations Bill. Mm -hmm. The promised land becomes, uh, un comes signified by the word integration. But I think that word integration doesn't quite capture it. What, a actually what African Americans were fighting for was freedom. Uh, how, do we, how can we be free to, to, 
to live peaceably in our own communities? Can we be free to be treated as, um, as equal citizens in the United States? And so civil rights and civil attainment become the metaphor for the promised land. And so as, as African-American preachers talked about the promised land, it was about ending Jim Crow. It was about ending segregation. It was, it was about finding new ways of living as first-class citizens mm -hmm. with equal rights. And then finally in the Black Power era, uh, right after, just after the death of Dr. King, mm -hmm. after the assassination, we find again African-Americans reconfiguring this Exodus story. Mm -hmm. And particularly folk like uh, uh, Reverend Albert Clave. Mm -hmm. And so what we'll do, we'll take this final break and then we'll come back and, okay. and continue. Right. And we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break. They missed something. They don't know they've missed anything. And so, <laughs> but if you sit up there and don't say anything, then yeah. that, 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 that draws attention. Mm. But just keep on talking. <laughs> I know that I've been mm. doing it for what, almost 30 years. Mm. So all you got to do is keep, keep on talking. <laughs> nobody paying any attention to what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. No, I love it. No, that's powerful, though. That, that's you know, helpful. Really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, yeah. they, you know, it, it really does have uh, an impact. Yeah, that's why I've been involved uh, with so long. That it makes a difference. It really does. Okay, you ready for this final segment? All right. Uh, let, let me, um, right, give me one more minute. One more minute. Mm -hmm. Let me think a moment. Mm. And so this is our 10-minute segment. All right. Ten and so everything that you wanted to mm -hmm. say before you got here, <laughs> this is your opportunity to say it. Mm. Okay. All right. I think okay. Okay, you have to take that break every time. Right? Every time, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Okay. Okay. Thank you and welcome back to the final segment of the show for today. We're talking to Professor Marlborough. He's given us some information in reference to African Americans and the Bible. And of course, let uh, take the final segment here, uh, Professor, to uh, not only uh, talk about African Americans and the Bible, but to try to uh, inform our audience in reference to what it means to be an African American in reference to the Bible. All right. Well, I think when we, when we, in the last segment, we were kind of going through a chronology of ways that African Americans use the Bible, and you can look at in the Civil Rights Movement, um, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's sermons, uh, particularly um, sermon Birth of a New Nation or sermon Death of Evil on the Seashore, where both take up the Exodus story and talk about ways that African Americans need to move toward freedom. Um, um, Adam Clayton Power Jr. does the same thing uh, in, in sermons at Abyssinian uh, Baptist Church. Um, and in the Black Power era, we see Albert Clay doing the same thing. But it, for Albert Clay, uh, Reverend Clegg did not see um, civil rights, or the attainment of civil rights as the promised land. Mm -hmm. He saw in the Black Power era, he saw um, autonomy, mm -hmm. that, it, that is self-direction um, as, as, um, as the promised land. And so he was hoping for African Americans to come together to support their own businesses, control their own schools, mm -hmm. um, find ways to protect their own communities from from police brutality and so forth. And, um, and so as he interpreted the Exodus story, the promised land becomes a sort of utopian life, a way, a way that African Americans could live um, without, the, without the, the assault of the vestiges of segregation and Jim Crow. In other words, a way to live away from the white man while believing in the Bible itself. Right, away, right, because they've al right, we have right. already been separated and segregated and right. we had to make some kind of come to uh, some kind of recognition of that. And mm -hmm. is that. Is that what we're saying here? In yeah, for him it was, it was a way of living outside of white racism. Mm -hmm. yeah, how do we live outside of, and how do we, and how do we 
fortify ourselves against it. And, and as he saw it, that means you have to control your own institutions, local control. You have to control your own schools, you have to control your own businesses, mm -hmm. and, and your own communities. And, um, and he, as he understood it, that was the only way that you could earn some respect in this society, that we, we would have to respect ourselves and control our own interests in this world. And so, and so those, are, those are sort of the five eras, if you will, uh, the antebellum period, Re Reconstruction, Harlem Renaissance, Civil Rights, and the Black Power era uh, for, um, for, for African-American biblical interpretation. And, we, um, and you see some of that uh, even today, uh, as we look at, um, again, ways that, um, particularly in the South, the Bible is still a part of our cultural vernacular. Um, you see it not only in church or in, you know, in sermons, but we also see the Bible used in political speech, speeches. I mean, it almost, you, you almost can't run for president if you, if you uh, don't make some reference to the Bible, even if all you know is 2 Corinthians. Mm -hmm. You yeah. still have to make some yeah, reference yeah. to the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> That's still a reference still to a reference, the Bible. Right. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> right. right, because it, it, it means is. means that it, at least you've seen it. You've seen it. <laughs> You, you may, may never have heard it in church, church. right? But you read it, and it said two Corinthians. That's exactly and that's, what it's saying. That's, that's about all yeah, you know. Uh -huh, yeah. uh -huh. And so, uh, it, because the Bible is, you know, pervades our culture mm -hmm. in, in a way that uh, I think no other book has. And so, um, and we still see um, ways that uh, communities interpret the Bible in terms of their own interests. I mean, you think, think about Christian evangelicals today, particularly white Christian evangelicals uh, today, uh, you find uh, more and more this identification with identification of Donald Trump, right? Mm -hmm. President Trump with the uh, idea mm -hmm. that this is a, a messianic figure, a figure sent by God to lead the United States. Mm -hmm. And uh, you wonder what happened to, you know, the kind of Christian mm -hmm. conservatives that were around in the 80s mm -hmm. where, where there was a, a certain, at, at least some adherence to mm -hmm. some idea of moral authority. And, and so there, there's now a way of taking up and, and finding biblical texts to support uh, Trump's racism, mm -hmm. to support his, uh, the, the ways that he's characterized and demonized mm -hmm. uh, immigrants misogyny. at the border, mm -hmm. the misogyny, mm -hmm. uh, certainly, and the ways that he's characterized and demonized um, 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 immigrants at the border, mm -hmm. uh, the policies that, that he has put in place that have ripped children away from families. And the, um, and the ways that he has emboldened a certain t kind of, a certain kind of police brutality uh, with his comments. Um, at, and so it, as, you, uh, as you think about ways that, you know, where Christian evangelicals were in the 80s, those types of things would not have been tolerated. Um, but here, uh, as Christian evangelicals now under see Trump as affirming their cultural interests, mm -hmm. right? It's a white cultural interest over against um, a, a broader presidential ideal, mm -hmm. right? A president for all, for all the United Christian States. Christian interests, yeah, which would right. include. Exactly. For everybody. For everybody. Mm -hmm. um, they have found ways to, for example, uh, I, I've read sermons and seen churches affirm, um, affirm Trump as a figural David. Mm -hmm. You know, they said David had flaws, but he was still used by God. He was the mm -hmm. apple of God's mm -hmm. eye. And you see this interpretation in churches. Mm -hmm. So it, again, they, you know, the Bible comes in in the book of Kings, where David's story is not, it, David's story is, is, is not a, uh, it, 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 it it's not a story of a king who had no moral failings. Mm -hmm. David's story yeah, is full of moral exactly. failings. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Trump's moral failings mm -hmm. uh, are read through that, and it creates a space for evangelicals to mm -hmm. support Trump anyway. Mm -hmm. And so um, as I work with African-American biblical interpretation, uh, I invite congregations to take up the Bible in ways that, in, in ways that affirm affirm life and culture, affirm black life and culture, take up the Bible in ways that, that speak for the, the thriving of all humanity, take up the Bible in ways, that, in ways that speak to the kind of world that God would want for us all, not just for some segment, and to, and to read the text in ways that, that speak to justice for those who have been downtrodden. I mean, what, what does the text say about the, the widow, the stranger, and the orphan? Uh, what does it say to us when we think about 
the, uh, think about immigrants. What does it say to us to follow someone like Jesus who healed people for free? Didn't mm -hmm. ask them about a medical card or insurance or how much they could pay, but what does it say about a society, our society, where, um, where, where thousands of people die because they don't have adequate health insurance? Uh, what does it say about our society, one of the wealthiest in the world, where, where children die here in Nashville mm -hmm. of poverty? All over the world. Yes, yes but right, yes, but right especially here, here, especially here, uh -huh. but all over the world. Mm -hmm. And what, is, what does it say about, um, uh, about our society when, um, when, when we take the Bible and somehow read it in a way that affirms, mm -hmm. affirms that kind of repression of, uh, of just, just life? Uh, I encourage congregations to take up the Bible and, and read it in ways that, that God has called all of us to be, to be for each other and with each other in community and in family and to, and to work for the betterment of, of human society. And that's something that, um, that's something that I've, I've traced in African American biblical interpretation. And you find it in, in certain progressive strands of white biblical interpretation as well. Um, but you don't find it here in, in, in this new brand of of Southern Christian evangelicalism, mm -hmm. uh, and that's something that that as we uh, as we struggle to figure out, mm -hmm. uh, that will be a major challenge for us going mm -hmm. forward. I think you can only say there's no room for it. You see, I think that things are going so fast and so unusual that uh, a lot of folks have to re-examine how they feel in reference to the Christian religion and in reference to the Bible. But Absolutely. I think, but I certainly agree with you that. Uh, the uh, time that we're living in now are essentially different yes. than uh, the times that we've talked about up until now. And so let me uh, thank you, Professor, for bringing that excellent information by. And uh, I'm encouraged by some of the things that you've said, and I believe that uh, the things that we've talked about today will have an impact upon some of the things when we talk about the Bible. Mm -hmm. People uh, rarely think in terms of the impact that uh, the Bible is having and Absolutely. has had upon all of us. But I want to thank you for coming by and giving us that excellent information today. And let me encourage our audience to tune in again next week 